part 10, the Gospel in Romans part 10. We began this series with the belief that our time is short. And we should make sure what little time is remaining, we serve the Lord correctly. Or shall we say, He is a priority in our lives. In the first three chapters, we saw that everyone is a sinner. Jew and Gentile, sin, sinner and saint. Everyone's a sinner. In the next five chapters, we saw uh, that again, the only way into the kingdom is absolute reliance on the Lord and his atoning sacrifice. Trusting our destiny to him and him alone is our perfect security. Chapters 9 through 11 detail the clear distinction between the church and Israel in terms of origin and destiny. Now, we'll turn to the, uh, our attention to the specific things we need to do uh, to prepare for the day we're called home to Jesus. Our objective is neither to earn or keep salvation, the things we can't do anyway, but to express our grat gratitude for having given it to us and store up treasure in heaven. That's what we're trying to do. It won't be long before the life we've worked hard so so hard to build for ourselves, here will be left behind. All that remain is the treasure we've stored up for ourselves in heaven. Romans 12, 1 and 2, please, Maxine. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies and live in sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In some parts of the world, <coughs> becoming a Christian is such a deadly thing to do that the only way to survive is to trust entirely on the leading of the Holy Spirit. However, that's not the case in most Western nations. Putting ourselves in God's hands <coughs> is not a matter of necessity for, uh, for the majority of us. So it comes down to choosing to trust entirely to, on God and the best motivation for that is gratitude. Do you fully appreciate all that God, through his son Jesus, has done for you? Not only has he died, that you can live forever, he also created an eternity for you that's beyond our wildest imagination. Now more than ever, those of us with one foot in the kingdom and one in the world need to ponder Elijah's question to Israel. And uh, 1 Kings 18.21a, and I shall, shall read it. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Jesus put it this way. Matthew 6, 24. Please die. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, 
for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This may be our last chance to <coughs> properly express our gratitude for all the Lord has done for us by devoting our remaining time here <coughs> to him. Most people when asked who they are do not reply, I'm a Christian. They consider that as an add-on to their normal life. They will tell you their occupation and then as an afterthought say, well I also go to church. Regretfully, being a Christian cannot be an add-on. We must see that we are Christians first and <coughs> therefore we are disciples. Some in the church will believe that there are two kinds of Christians, disciples and followers. It's impossible to be just a follower. We're all disciples in accordance with the um, amplified, the AS, the authorised uh, study uh, uh, version, the something BBE, the ERV, the, um, and the ESV. They all translate Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We must say that we are disciples. In fact, the people of Antioch were so impressed with the followers of Christ that in Acts 11, 26, the latter part of that verse, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The people of Antioch called them Christians, meaning they were little Christs. The world would certainly benefit from our undivided effort on his behalf. We must, if we're determined to follow a Christ, at least make him our legitimate first priority. Romans 12, 3 to 8. Please note, Romans 12, 3 to 8. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them, let us use them, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, if we take that, each one of us has been given special gifts that uniquely equip us for service. One of the truly exciting <coughs> treasure hunts of the Christian life lies in discovering what gifts we have been given. The gifts he gave to us may be different from those he gave to others around us. So that when we work together, everyone 
makes a mean, meaningful contribution. None of us can do that on our own. Some assert that every human being has one or more of these gifts from God, that they've all been passed down to us from our first father, Adam, who possessed them all. I'm reading a, um, a portion of a, a, a commentary here. They also point out that many of the greatest statesmen, philanthropists, professors, business leaders, scientists and public servants don't give evidence of any commitment to faith and yet by all accounts they've been gifted. Moreover, it is surprising to learn that in all these fields some of the most outstanding practitioners, pra practitioners throughout the age of man have been Jewish. Mm. After all, they're, one, they're the ones with an unbroken line to Adam. <laughs> which is given to us in genealogy of Jesus uh, in Luke uh, 3. Mm. But, let's understand, this is only one list of the three that is contained in the New Testament. Okay. Romans chapter 12 lists the gifts of God. There are also the gifts of Christ. Which is called the Doma gifts. Which is Ephesians 4.11 Ok Ephesians 4.11 Please uh, Ross And he himself gave to, to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers it's believed by some people that a case can be made that all born-again believers show tendencies in at least one of these areas given by the Lord Jesus to build up his body. In other words, every single person gave uh, or uh, demonstrates a, 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 either their apostle or prophet or evangelist, pastor, or teacher. And finally, there are gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the charismatic gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. The charismatic gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Please. Round one, two is twelve, eight to ten. Okay, thank you. But to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, <coughs> to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the <coughs> same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. The Holy Spirit drip distributes his gifts to each believer as he sees fit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now most people don't realise that Paul separated believers 
into three general groupings in explaining the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to have to clean the board off and we're going to have to run it again. Now, it's important 1 group consists of those who are given gifts of knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom. That's one group. Another group gets extraordinary faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy and discernment. Miraculous healing, extraordinary faith, miraculous power, prophecy and discernment. And the third group gets tongues and interpretation. You have read and understood 1 Corinthians 12 in the Greek. You have to read it to understand it. Okay. But when you do, it's clearly there. This grouping of believers is derived from two different Greek words. They are both translated another. First of all, we get Alos. And we also get heteros. Now both are translated another. But actually, alos means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. To make it plain to you, I have repeated the scripture, putting in the place of another the Greek translation of the word. So, 1 Corinthians 12, 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to alos, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To heteros, faith by the same Spirit. To alos, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To alos, the working of miracles. To alos, prophecy. To alos, discerning of spirits. To heteros, Divers kind of tongues to another, the interpretation of tongues. Depending on what word is used for another, that shows the different groupings. The only reason for Paul to use these diff two different words, as he did, was to divide the gifts and their recipients into the three groups which I have detailed. Think of this think of it this way. Say you're a Greek person living in biblical times and have just eaten a chicken sandwich. Somebody asks you, in Greek of course, would you like another sandwich? If he or she uses the word alos, it means you are being offered another chicken sandwich. But if the word is heteros, 
it means you're being offered a different kind of sandwich. Now you would have to ask, what kind? Before making up your mind. Everybody understand? Mm. It's very important because it shows that this, uh, that, 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 that there are three groups. And all time, I have separated them into a different group as Sheila would know, and uh, it's important that we do it correctly. So it is with the spiritual uh, gifts. They are given to believers, but some kinds, gifts of one kind are given to one group of believers, while other gifts of a different kind are given to another group. Now, <laughs> You think you've finished. <laughs> you haven't. We're not told what criteria are used to assigning, uh, in assigning believers in these groups. However, the fact that they are assigned to believers as the Holy Spirit wills offers proof that it's unscriptural to expect all believers to manifest the same gift. Mm. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Mm. Where are we up to? Me. Okay. 1 Corinthians 12. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Which is a theatrical question. Mm. At this time, I would like to observe that the entire Trinity is involved in equipping us with various gifts. Paul makes sure we understand that the Trinity, tr Trinity is always involved when it comes to important mat mat matters concerning us. In this case, you've got the gifts from the Father which is Romans 12, 3. Die, please, read, read that. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Gifts from the Son... Ephesians 4, 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay. And gifts from the Holy Spirit, which I have just read, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the manif manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. It is also generally true that our particular gifts will emerge as we draw close to the Lord and prepare ourselves for service. Because our gifts are designed to help us accomplish His will for our lives. If you are like most Christians, you haven't been prepared well, However, don't let anyone tell you that you are not equipped. Mm. But the Lord will give you a gift, and with that gift, you will be equipped. Mm. You're like a piece of precision ma ma uh, machinery, capable of great things, but lacking the hand of a skilled Start preparing for your, your, yourself for service and watch the Lord go to work with you to cause your gifts to blossom. Now, Paul continues the rest of this chapter with exhortations that can be grouped under three different he headings. Now, first one is love. 
And that's Romans 12, 9 to 12. Romans 12, 9 to 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honour giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation continuing steadfastly in prayer. This can be summed up in this way. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Okay. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly, uh, bro brotherly love. On another, uh, one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal and keep your spiritual server, fervor serving the Lord. I'll get it right. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Okay. Practice hospitality, which is the, the second group. Romans 12, 13 to 17. Romans 12, 13 to 17. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but con condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. We can sum it up this way. Share with God's people who are in need. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in <coughs> harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Peter says much the same in 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are therefore uh, thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. But we need to go to, to, to need to uh, recognize, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And the second, the, the third. Live peaceably, which is Romans 12, 18 to 21. Please, Max. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Be loved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And live peaceably can be summed up in this way. 
If it is possible, as the far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is, uh, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord, which is from Deuteronomy 32-35. On the contrary, we read in Proverbs 25, 21 and 22, Proverbs 25, 21 and 22, please done. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And finally, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm. This simple list of exhortations at the end of chapter 12, along with the ones in, in the chapters yet to come, explains how we accomplish the commands at its beginning. By doing these things, we're presenting our whole beings as living sacrifices. By doing them, we're no longer conforming to the ways of this world, but are being transformed by the renewing of our minds. This list of actions, if sincerely followed, will change us from the self-centred, self-promoting, self-serving people we have naturally become, and make us a channel for the Lord's love. As we become more like Him, the area of our gifts will begin to emerge. Not only this, but just as you'd expect from the Lord, moving fully into the area of our giftedness brings blessings impossible to experience in an ordinary